Meanwhile, Iran's supreme leader reportedly thanking his country's armed forces for the attack on Israel last week, saying that Iran, quote, demonstrated its power. This coming after Israel's retaliatory strike on Iran on Friday, which damaged an Iranian air defense system. Iran says now it has no plans to retaliate there. But The New York Times was reporting this morning that Israel, quote, planned a bigger attack on Iran, but scaled it back to avoid war. Joining me now is America First Policy Institute Center for American Security co-chairman, Fox News contributor and former national security advisor to President Trump and VP Mike Pence, Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg back with us. Lieutenant General, it's great to see you this morning. Thanks very much for being here. Where do you see this Iran-Israel conflict moving next? Yeah, Maria, thanks for having me this morning. Good morning. Look, I think everybody's starting to take, the, to use a military term, taking a knee, which is sort of taking a deep breath uh, for what happened. You know, with the Iranians put a pretty significant complex attack against the Israelis, where they used ballistic missiles, they used uh, cruise missiles, and they used drones as well. Well over 300, the largest direct attack from Iran on Israel, Israel that they've had. And then the Israelis responded quite well with an attack on Iran. And here's what actually happened when you look Look at it. You know, the, def the Israeli defense system work worked really well. It's a tiered defense system, air defense system, with the arrow, which is the upper end against the ballistic missiles. Then you had David Sling, which cruise missiles, and then the Iron Dome, which is against figured drones, plus the other Allied support in the air. Uh, it really was able to defeat most of those systems coming in. But here's the kicker. When you look at where those missiles were heading, especially ballistic missiles, they actually hit Nevatim Air Base. And Nevatim is right next to Dimona, which is the nuclear site for Israel. The Israelis responded. When the Israelis went back, they went to Isfahan. What's at Isfahan? It's right next to the Natanz nuclear facility of Iran. And I think both sides all of a sudden realized, uh-oh, we're, we're at a level now. We're starting to cross something here, which is could get pretty dangerous when you're attacking both countries' nuclear facilities. And there, they actually created a bit of a deterrence level. We didn't do that. And we remember this is an administration that said to the Israelis, don't, or to the Iranians, don't, and they did. And then the Israelis, well, don't go, you know, take the wind, don't respond. And the Israelis just, just disregarded that. So I think what's happened now is you've actually seen a level of deterrence established by both sides, which is good. Good for the Israelis in the sense that now they can focus in on Hamas, focus in on going down and finishing the job down in Rafah and completing the mission that they had there. And the Iranians saying, okay, we'll take a little bit of a win and back off from there. Yeah, well, look, I mean, this next story is, is pretty stunning. I want to get your take on how Israeli leaders are now criticizing these reports that Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is about to put sanctions on an Israeli Defense Forces military battalion in the coming yeah. days. They are accused of violating human rights back in 2022. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu posted this on X. If somebody thinks they can impose sanctions on a unit in the IDF, I will fight this with all my powers. Lieutenant General, I mean, where are the sanctions on the human rights abusers in China? Where are the sanctions against all of the abuse yeah. that we're seeing from communist China in so many other ways? Instead, they're turning their sanctions on the IDF in the middle of this war? Yeah, we really send very, very mixed signals, this administration does. To start with on this unit they're talking about, it's called the Yehuda Battalion. It's Orthodox Jews. Normally, the Orthodox Jews don't join in the military of Israel. They do now. And that's because when you look at the population of Israel, it's about 16 percent Orthodox, and they want to bring those that manpower in. And it, it's actually a unit that's actually operating in the West Bank, not in Gaza itself. And then you look at the administration, it's almost like, look, start supporting your friends. Make a very clear line of who we're with, you know, because the, the, the adversaries, your enemies, they always look for a gap or a seam. And if they see this seam or a gap created by the United States, that they're trying to be, quote, equal handed, it's wrong. We should look at the Israelis and say, you're in a fight for your life. We're with you full stop and go from there. Yeah, I mean, look, um, the House passed the $95 billion foreign aid package on Saturday. The slate of bills mm -hmm. include $60 billion for Ukraine, $26 billion for Israel, humanitarian yeah. aid for Gaza, $8 billion for the uh, Indo-Pacific region. It is now headed to the Senate, where it could pass as soon as tomorrow. You know, yesterday yeah. spoke with Utah Senator Mike Lee, and he said this was a bad bunch of bills, particularly the $9 billion that he said is going to Hamas. So your thoughts on that humanitarian aid that is going to Gaza, which Mike Lee seems to believe it's going right to Hamas. 
Well, it, you know, Marie, it is going right to Hamas. Where do they think it's going to? Of course it goes there, because Hamas is the ruling entity within Gaza itself. But when you go to this large bill, you know, you look at the Ukraine bill as well. You know, it's almost like a pox on both your houses. First of all, the Ukrainians have fought valiantly against the Russian aggression. But when you look at it, you look at the House and you say, look, there's ways you could have sent this to, told this to the American people and sold this. You know, I'd ask them, look at your history. You you go back to the 1941 Lendley's Act when President Roosevelt was in a lot of trouble with the American people, who were very isolationist at the time. There's a way to sell an, an aid package to 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 a very concerned public, and that's a, a perfect way to do it. And when you look at the uh, Ukrainians, I also push back a little bit on them as well. Look, if you're in a fight for your life, then mobilize, 100 percent mobilize. And said all they do, they reduce their draft age from 27 to 25. And I said, listen, pull up all of your people, fully mobilize the country to go to war. So you kind of look at it, there's a little bit of, you know, concern on everybody's side out there. Now, saying that again, like I just made the comment, the Ukrainians are in the fight for their lives and have fought valiantly against Russian aggression. But also when you look back on uh, what's happening here in America, we owe it to the American people to explain how we're doing this and what we're doing. And I blame the Biden administration very strongly because they have not come up with a strategic plan. You know, uh, as long as it takes, as much as it takes, is a bumper sticker. It's not a strategic plan. Yeah. yeah they owe that very, to the American people and they've yeah. yet to deliver that. Yep. Let's speak, jump in. I could not echo what you just said more aggressively. It, we, there is no plan. I don't think from the beginning that Joe Biden has articulated or our military articulated a plan for victory. They didn't even ever talk about winning this war. So mm -hmm. to your point, I think what the American people want to know, what will this incremental $40 billion mean? How will it be right. spent in such a way to shorten the war, to bring it to a conclusion, to win the war? Do you have any thoughts about how they could frame that? Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I do. I actually taught, testified in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee a little more a year ago, went to the Republican Study Committee as well. And, and when you look at what they're doing with this administration, it's actually, they're truly whistling past the graveyard. Uh, over a year ago, they really had the Russians on their heels. If we'd provided the correct supplies that they actually needed, aircraft, air defense system, long-range artillery, they could have probably had a change to it. Right now, the Russians are on the move. The Russians are in an attrition fight. And I will say very candidly, this is the way the Russians traditionally fight, as attrition. They throw more people, more equipment, more ammunition, more armor, more artillery at you than you can possibly handle. And that has always been my concern. If you get to an attrition fight, the Ukrainians are on their back foot. So this equipment that's going there, you almost have to say, okay, what is the end state? You know, the guy who's got this right is Donald J. Trump when he said, look, everybody take a deep breath, figure out how you're going to get to the next steps, if necessary, negotiate. Now, when you say negotiate, that does not mean you give up something. That means you get everybody together, kind of slow it down, everybody take a deep breath. And, and they're not doing that because there's no plan to do it. And again, I made that comment earlier, and I really believe this. The plan, the, the Biden administration doesn't have a plan. Again, you know, when they when they make the comment, as long as it takes, as much as it takes, doesn't mean anything. doesn't mean anything to the Russians. You have to make the Russians pay a price, and you have to help the Ukrainians. So this is actually, if you want to know the truth, this is a mess. Saying that, and I will be very candid with you, the most important national security issue we have in the United States is our southern border, and they're just ignoring that. They ignored it this weekend as well. They need to address that first or in a primary way, and they haven't done it. And I, the world's exploding on us. When you look just That's not right. only at the southern border, but you look at what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in the Far East, what's happening in Europe, major problems in this administration is just avoiding it. That's exactly right. That is the plan, okay? Do everything else other than the border. <laughs> That's their plan. Ign ignore the wide open border where we are watching national security uh, at risk as a result of this. Um, Lieutenant General, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thanks very much.